In this video, I want to talk with you about the power of the devil versus the power of God. The power of the devil is permitted by God. And so if there is someone over you who is permitting you to do something, you don't have power. The power belongs to the one who is over you. All power belongs to God. The devil has no power but that which you give him when you permit him to enter your life through your sin or what God is permitting him to do in order to test you, build you, discipline, punish. I want you to pay attention to the language that's being used with regard to the devil versus God. Specifically, I want you to understand that God is doing something here. There's an emphasis on kingdoms, on two kingdoms. One kingdom belongs to God, the other belongs to the devil, and we know ahead of time that the kingdom that belongs to the devil is going to end up in the lake of burning sulfur. Now we look at this and we would say, well, who would be so stupid as to choose the kingdom of the devil if they know ahead of time that it's gonna go into the lake of burning sulfur? The answer to that is those who don't believe. Unbelievers who have no sense, who ha don't even have the sense to care about themselves and to care about their future and their salvation. Those who choose the carnal, who choose the temporary, who choose the flesh, in this life. So when we're talking about the devil versus God, what we're talking about in part are the kingdoms, what God is fulfilling, both through the devil in order to capture wickedness, because that's what's being what that's what's happening. God even uses that language. He says, "You will be entrapped and ensnared and you will fall backward." So he is capturing wickedness through the devil, and he is bringing in righteousness to him. He is separating the wheat from the tares. And this is done based on the heart. Now listen to the language that's being used regarding God consistently. Revelation 1.4. Grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, and who is to come. Verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Revelation 4, 8. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Revelation eleven seventeen. We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Okay, we don't have the who is to come because that's the who is to come. This is what he's doing right now. He's taken his great power and begun to reign. That's who has been to come. Now let's look at the kingdom of the enemy. Revelation seventeen eight. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and yet will come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. Is it possible that this is a man? Because from John's perspective... When he's seeing this vision, and in his, as he's in this vision, he is in the kingdom of the United States in the 90s that took down atheistic communism, that took down communism. So from his perspective during that time in the vision, this beast already was, now is not from that perspective, and yet will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction. Hello, guys. Men don't live that long. This could not be a human being. This is a kingdom. And that kingdom is described in Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and Revelation 17. It is the fifth kingdom of papal Rome. And in Revelation, that kingdom of papal Rome is the harlot riding the beast. The woman, the church, riding the beast, which is government. Papal Rome. That is a church and it is a government. And that harlot is also defined as Babylon the Great. And when you see her name, you see Babylon the Great, the mother. Mother. What defines a mother? She's got children. And she is a mother of all prostitutes. Prostitutes prostitute themselves to the world. To images that you were never supposed to set up. Images of a so-called Jesus fish, the cross, pictures of Jesus, relics, statues. These are images and idols. You are never supposed to set them up. So why is it that these statues, relics, crosses 
are, are being defined as symbols of Christianity. Well, they are symbols. They are images of something, but they are not of Christianity because Christianity does not have a symbol or an image. Christianity belongs to Christ, not man. It is not a club. It is not inclusive. It is exclusive. Those are the images of prostitutes. They belong to a different kingdom. Holidays like Christmas and Easter. What do people not understand about don't add to the scroll and don't take away from it? Don't add to what God commands and don't take away from it. You're not worshiping Jesus on Christmas. If you were worshiping truly during his holy days, you would know how to worship him and you would know what he requires on his holy days. Very different from the world's holidays. Easter is not Passover. Passover is observed for eight days. It's called Passover because God called it Passover because he wanted us to understand that he passed over the Egyptians and that he will pass over us later on and during this time when he's bringing his wrath. So these are prostitutes. I don't have time to list out all of the prostitutions, but these are some pretty obvious ones. Okay, so the kingdom of Satan, the beast which you saw once was, now is not, and yet will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction. Once was, now is not, and yet will come up out of the abyss to go to its destruction. What was the description of God? Was, is, and is yet to come. The Alpha and Omega, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. This one is a pathetic description. Who was, it, now is not, but will rise to go to its destruction. Again, 1711, the beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and again is going to its destruction, his destruction. The beast, by the way, is Satan and the kingdom of Satan. You have to understand that what God is doing right now is building his kingdom. There's an emphasis on kingdoms. He's doing something. Woman was made for man, not man made for woman. Now think about that for a minute. Think about how the wicked treat this. Contrast that with the wicked, who they think he is, that they think he is for them, and that this leads to the wrong pro posture of requiring him to submit to them, him to follow them around all day. They don't want a God who requires them to change. They want a God who will contort for them according to the delusion of their fabricated Messiah. You remember that Eve was made for Adam. Now, don't take that the wrong way because wicked men take this the wrong way all the time. They think that they can just treat women however they want. But that's not what God does with his woman, with his church. And you can't have it both ways. He loves and cares for us. He's not abusive to us. But we do belong to him. He has redeemed us. He has created us. And he has created us for his good pleasure. His goal is for us to be in him and he in us. That was Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Just as Jesus is in the Father and the Father in him. And Paul says, you don't join Christ with a prostitute. You would not join his body with a prostitute. And so it, prostitutes need to go. Those who live according to the world... Those who do not obey his commands, those who do not have a heart for him, they got to go. God's not concerned about a big church. He can raise up stones as children for Abraham. It's not a concern. He does not need us. We need him. And so we need to submit to him and what he's doing with us. This is the attitude that we need to take. What is it that you want to do with me today? My daughter sent me a scripture this morning that I think is very fitting. It's 1 Samuel 15. Verse 22, but Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance is like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. So this is what Samuel told Saul because Saul had gone into a land. He was told you kill everyone there and their livestock. And he brought back the livestock because, as he says later on, well, I was afraid of the, of the men, so I did what they wanted me to do. But here Samuel says very clearly, the Lord does not delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying him. 
at the end of the day, what does God really need from you but to rend your heart to who he is and what he requests, requires of you? Then Saul said to Samuel, I've sinned. I've violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You've rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe, and, and it tore. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today, and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he's not a human being that he should change his mind. Samuel replied, I've sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel went back with Saul and Saul worshiped the Lord. Then Samuel said, bring me a God, king of the Am Amalekites. A God came to him in chains and he thought, surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so will your mother be childless among women. And Samuel put a God to death before the Lord at Gilgal. Then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went up to to his home in Gibeah of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. And what, one of the things my daughter was saying today when she had sent this to me is, this reminds me of when people are going to be saying to him, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we? Aren't we yours? And he's going to say, depart from me, evildoers, I never knew you. Satan's power, his reign, has to be permitted to him. And the reason it's permitted is when God is taken out of the way. That's when that is permitted. And no one can really take God out of the way. But because God is a respecter of choice, when people choose not to obey him and they choose to spurn him, that's when he says, all right, I'm going to hand you over to the one you've chosen. And he says to us, who will care for you? Think about that for a minute. Who's going to care for you? The only one who cares about you is God. He is the only good. And, and if a person cares for you, it's because God is in them. It's because God has put that in them. No one's going to care for you. If you have not chosen God, he will not choose you. God was, is, and will be forever. The devil's kingdom was, now is not, but is rising to go to its destruction. That sums up the power of the devil versus the power of God. Now please discern with God and choose wisely.